Yeah, thank you, Jamie, and uh, I wish to thank the scientific uh, board of the meeting to invite me and to allow me to discuss with you the role of the microbiome in GVHD. <coughs> now, um, the idea of manipulati manipulating the microbiome uh, in the setting of allergenic stem cell transplantation is not a new one. Uh, uh, we have this old data that uh, mice grown in a germ-free condition do not develop uh, graft versus host disease after transplantation, at least of marrow. You see 100% survival if mice are grown under germ-free conditions. If the mice are brought back to a conventional surrounding germ-free only for eight days, almost all mice die from GVHD. And if it's intermediate at day 26, you can see uh, one third of mice die from GVHD. These were data from Van Beckham. He later confirmed the role of the intestinal microflora, which we now call the intestinal microbiome, also in rhesus monkeys, and there were other data in dogs. And finally, the first data, a small date series in uh, patients, uh, that uh, this germ-free conditions could help to prevent GVHD. And since that time, decontamination is still one approach we are using in many centers uh, currently. On the other hand, we know that antibiotic prophylaxis in acute leukemia and stem cell transplant patients has an impact on all cause mortality and a reduction of febrile episodes. So uh, the rationale was prevention of GVHD and infections for prophylaxis. Now we have to be aware that these data and these findings were based on analysis of bacteria which were culturable. And it's now clear that maximum of 30% of the microbiota in our body are culturable. So with the introduction of new techniques to characterize the microbiome in a culture-independent way, like the high-throughput sequencing of the 16S ribosomal RNA, we could get a completely different view on the microbiota of the whole body, but especially of the gut. This was part of the Human Microbiome Project. In a summary, uh, this project described a large proportion of commensal, mainly anaerobic bacteria like Clostridia species, Bacteroidetes, and they showed that these were associated with protection from inflammatory and autoimmune disease. We now know that uh, 30 trillion human cells uh, encounter 100 trillion uh, microbial cells in the body. And what is most important, the current estimate is that we have 1.5 million metabolites from these microbial cells which interact with the human cells and um, uh, govern many of the physiological processes in our body. Now, when we now applied these new culture-independent techniques uh, like the 16S RNA analysis to stem cell transplant patients, we saw a completely different picture. We saw in, two, uh, in both uh, studies an early loss of intestinal microbiota diversity. The first study came from the Sloan Kettering from Robert Yank. Uh, they sh showed both in mice and humans that uh, if they developed graft versus host disease, then there was a major loss within the Glostridialis and Lactobacillalis group. And they also showed if they pre-treated mice with broad-spectrum antibiotics, this induced a microbiome shift, and this reduced in accelerated GVHD with increased pathology and reduced survival. We also performed a series uh, of microbiota analysis in 31 patients, and again we observed the early loss of the commensal bacteria, especially from the Glostridialis group. And in our setting, we saw a strong abundance uh, in some patients, even 100% abundance of enterococci. 
which was caused by the prophylactic and therapeutic antibodies and was even worse at, uh, if in the presence of gastrointestinal GVHD. Now, these changes have prognostic significance. Here, the uh, New York group divided the patients according to the diversity indices found in the microbiota samples 15 days after transplantation. And you have a group with high diversity, which means they have a lot of commensals, and a, a group of with low diversity, which means uh, there are a few uh, uh, genus left, and uh, commensals are mainly gone. And you can see you have a big difference in survival after three years, which is mainly to non-relapse-related mortality. This was later on uh, specifically shown for the genus Plotzia by Robert Yang. Again, abundance of Plotzia would uh, associate with high diversity and protect against GVH-related mortality. Now, our group used a different uh, approach to analyze microbiota diversity, and uh, we <coughs> uh, went back to the metabolites produced by this bacteria, and one interesting group of metabolites are indoles. Indoles are derived from tryptophan in the gastrointestinal tract. If commensal bacteria have tryptophanase, they can uh, uh, convert uh, tryptophan to indole. This indole is taken up by the gut, is uh, transported to the liver, and in the liver you have sulfatation, so you have an indoxyl sulfate as a product, and this indoxyl sulfate is then excreted to the urine where we can measure a bacterial metabolite. We came to, uh, to the uh, indoxyl sulfate because there were studies comparing germ-free mice and mice uh, in conventional surroundings, and one of the completely absent metabolites in germ-free mice was this indoxyl sulfate. So we have, can now say high indoxyl sulfate levels in the urine indicates many commensals, high diversity, and low indoxyl sulfate, few commensals, low diversity. Now, when we did a serial analysis of indoxyl sulfate levels in 130 patients at different time points after transplantation, we observed that low indoxyl sulfate levels, again, very early, in the first 10 days after transplantation, predicted the long-term outcome. You can see here the patients with low indoxyl sulfate levels. Remember, this means low commensals, low diversity, and the, uh, the treatment-related mortality of patients with high indoxyl sulfate levels means high diversity, and again, it's predictive. Early loss of diversity uh, is associated with poorer outcome. When we ask for the factors affecting this indoxyl sulfate levels, we saw that prophylactic and therapeutic antibiotics influenced uh, the indoxyl sulfate levels, and we also found a well-known uh, genetic risk factor, the not 2 card 15 SNPs, which we had reported 10 years before, which represent a receptor associated with antibacterial defense. So here is a link uh, to our previous work. So let's go in detail to prophylactic and later on to therapeutic antibodies. Now, as we observed this almost complete shift to enterococcal flora, and we even had an outbreak of vancomycin-resistant enterococci at the time, um, in our uh, 16S analysis, we decided to stop our previous decontamination with ciprofloxacin, metronidazole, and switched to rifaximine, a non-absorbable uh, anti antibiotic. As you can see here, the mean early uh, indoxyl sulfate levels were much higher in the rifaximine group. So again, they left these leaves, uh, obviously, some of the commensal clostridia. And as you also can see here uh, in the rifaximine group, the mortality was lower. And this translated also in a 
quite different outcome three years after transplantation with a GVH, acute and chronic GVHD-related mortality of 40%, almost 40% in the old decontamination group and uh, of 19% in the rifaximin group. Now let's go a step further to antibiotic treatment. Um, here we did a combined analysis together with the colleagues from the Sloan Kettering Center, and we analyzed 621 patients undergoing allergenic transplantation, t repleted uh, transplantation, and we analyzed the impact of timing of antibiotic treatment on outcome. <coughs> we made three groups an early antibiotic group, which received antibiotics before the day of transplant, late antibiotic groups, which received uh, antibiotics on the day of transplant or thereafter, and we had a no antibiotic group with no, no antibi systemic antibiotics given throughout the transplant. The striking result was that there was a highly different um, um, treatment-related mortality with regard to the timing of antibiotics. The lowest treatment-related mortality, and look, this is 80 months after transplantation, was in the no antibiotic groups, those patients who did not need systemic broad-spectrum antibiotics, and the highest mortality up to 50% in the early antibiotic group. Many colleagues said, okay, the early antibiotic groups are patients with far advanced diseases. Uh, they have a, a lot of additional risk factors. So we did a variety of risk analysis, uh, risk scores, Kanofsky index, performance index, uh, the stage at the time uh, of transplantation. But this effect of early use of systemic broad-spectrum antibiotics showed up in each risk group, even in the low risk group, indicating that it's an independent risk factor for outcome. How does this work? Again, we looked at the microbiota, and we see that we had a, differ a different composition of the commensal microbiota. Here you see the indoxyl le sulfate levels in the early antibiotic group, in the late antibiotic group, and the no antibiotic group, again at the 0 to 10. And I have shown you that this is a risk factor for a poor outcome. And uh, both the New York group and also our group also made direct analysis on the commensal bacteria. Here is one example. We have a PCR for clostridial uh, group 14A, and we applied this to the samples of our patients, and uh, you can see the late uh, no antibiotic group has, uh, uh, is close to 10 uh, to the 9 uh, copy numbers, which is close to the status of normal patients, but the early antibiotic group has lost this crostidia, again lost the commensal uh, group of bacteria. Similar observations were very recently published by a Canadian group and uh, by a pediatric group showing that depletion of Clostridia is associated um, with increased mortality, and they have also shown this in a murine experiment. Now, when we ask for the mechanisms, Jamie mentioned this already, uh, we come to metabolites produced by this bacteria. We know, the, I mentioned, the uh, huge interaction of bacteria with human cells by protective metabolites, and there's also huge interactions between the different bacteria and the species in the gut. So we have one group, the indoles, you know them already, produced from dietary tryptophan, and they are known to support, support survival of mixed microbial co communities. They are known to uh, induce colonization resistance. Uh, this is a, a part of the mechanism of colonization resistance uh, we frequently discuss in, in infectious uh, disease models. But they also have impact on the epithelial cell barrier properties that strengthen it. They are anti-inflammatory at the cytokine at T-cell level, and a very important aspect is indoles bind to the aryl hydrocarbon receptor of innate lymphoid cells type 3, and then induce the production of interleukin-22, which is an important cytokine for protection of epithelial cells. 
Now, even more, uh, we recently started experiments we are looking for the immunomodulation by indoors. Sakila Gimire from our group incubated dendritic cells with LPS in the presence or absence of indoxyl sulfate levels as we find it in the urine and in the serum of patients. And to our surprise, this indoxyl sulfate suppressed the pro-inflammatory phenotype of dendritic cells, IL-12 goes down at the cytokine level, at the RNA level. And on the other hand, IL-10 goes up and we saw similar effects for CD80 and CD86. And when we used this indoxyl sulfate incubated dendritic cells in mixed lymphocyte cultures, uh, there was much less interferon gamma pro uh, production and even in uh, some cultures a rise of regulatory T cells. So this is a clear example how commensal bacteria try to tolerate the human immune system in order to live in a peaceful uh, uh, coexistence. The other large group of protective metabolites are the short-chain fatty acids, especially butyrate is here important. Again, they are important for epithelial integrity like tight junction and survival of epithelial cells. And again, they are anti-inflammatory, they downregulate IL-12, they downregulate co-stimulatory molecules, and they can induce regulatory T cells. <coughs> this is shown by the group uh, from Ann Arbor and New York. Uh, they uh, have uh, used butyrate gavage to uh, 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 protect against GVHD, and they also introduced a 17 strain cocktail of Clostridia in the GVH model. As you can see here, the 17 strain cocktail induced higher butyrate levels in the lumen and in the cell wall of the intestinal wall. And if uh, uh, added in a GVH model, it protected against GVHT to some extent as compared to the GVH model without this 17 strain Clostridia. So again, we have here Clostridia producing protective metabolites and protecting against <coughs> inflammation. Now, when it comes to GVHD, Jamie mentioned this, then there is panet cell damage in addition to the disturbed microbiota. And we asked the question, uh, drives this further uh, loss of microbiota diversity? Here you can uh, see the number of panet cells in biopsies from patients uh, uh, without GVHD and with severe GVHD, and you see the uh, a strong decrease of panet cells, and we have now tested the antimicrobial peptides in the biopsies, uh, alpha defensin 5 and 6, and also REC3 alpha. Here are patients without GVHD and patients with GVHD, and you see that both antimicrobial peptides are going down, which is in accordance with the loss of panet cells. And the consequence, the functional consequence, is seen here when we analyzed the indoxyl sulfate levels at the, uh, at the time of biopsy. Those who had not no GVHD had higher indoxyl sulfate levels than those who had GVHD, indicating that the microbiome is even further disturbed at the time of Kraft versus host disease. So, taking all this together, we can uh, think of TVHD as a disturbed balance, disturbed balance of microbiota, but also disturbed balance of cells regulated by microbiota, like innate lymphoid cells, like regulatory T cells. And of course, the question is, can we modulate this? And there's a huge uh, uh, variety of options, and it's summarized here. I talked about antibiotics, so we can change the decontamination strategy. We even can skip decontamination. We should think about our timing of antibiotics or whether we use can commensal sparing antibiotics. There are other strategies blocking uh, uh, bacteria, pathogenic bacteria. We recently published on this oral immunoglobulin. 
then we could go to prebiotics. So uh, commensal bacteria need uh, non-digestible carbohydrates like fibers, and there are several trials under the way using fibers as additional nutrients in the context of stem cell transplantation. We could use postbiotics. I mentioned uh, the beneficial effect of indoors and short-chain fatty acids, and this would have the advantage that they are not just destroyed by antibiotics. And of course, uh, we, again, we could change uh, the food. And we can use probiotics, directly apply uh, microbiota, like in the fecal microbiota transplantation, and on the long run, defined consortia will be developed. That this really works was recently shown by two small publications where uh, the colleagues from Japan and from Graz used fecal microbiota transplantation from healthy related stem cell donors in four patients with steroid resistance or steroid dependent uh, GVHD. Here they had a healthy unrelated uh, uh, donor in both studies, transfer of fecal microbiota was safe without any severe adverse effects, no infections. And it was striking that in this series, uh, there were three complete responses and one partial response in steroid refractory GVHD with restoration of commensals and also responses in the Graz series. Now, finally, I would like to mention that microbiota play not only a role with regard to graft versus host disease and um, uh, toxicity of stem cell transplantation. There is more and more evidence that also the efficacy of cytotoxic treatment and also of checkpoint inhibitors is strongly influenced by microbiota. In this study by Natalie Flug, they showed that lymphoma treatment with DHAP gives 20% less survival if you concomitantly block uh, uh, gram-positive bacteria with vancomycin. And I think we will have to consider a lot of things in our hematology oncology, uh, uh, oncology setting in the future. A very interesting recent paper, again from the New York uh, group, there is also association of specific microbiota with relapse. They found that abundance of the oil bacterium limosum, another commensal bacterium, associates with reduced risk of relapse, and it will be very interesting to see whether these are specific T-cell antigen interactions which uh, contribute to GVL effect, or what <coughs> is the mechanism behind this protection from GVL, even by the microbiota. I hope I could give you an overview about the current role and view on the microbiota in the setting of allergenic transplantation. And I finally want to thank my research group, especially Dan Daniela Weber and Sakila Gimire, our collaborating groups, uh, both in New York, uh, Marcel van den Brink's group and Jamie Ferrara's group. At the local level, Peter Oefner, who is running the, uh, the urinary ES uh, assays, and Andre Gessner, who is doing, doing the 16S uh, sequencing. And of course, I would like to acknowledge the grant support by the DFG, the Jose Carreras Leukemia Foundation, and the European Commission. And I wish to thank you for your attention.